I'm now going to introduce our speaker for the day. Dr. Scott Lieberman is a physician scientist at the University of Iowa. As a pediatric rheumatologist, he cares for children with rheumatic diseases, including Sjogren's. As a laboratory researcher, he studies how the immune system attacks the tear and saliva producing glands in Sjogren's. He also helps lead the International Childhood Sjogren's Workshop to define Sjogren's disease in children. Through these efforts, he hopes to understand why this autoimmune disease develops, how we can better diagnose it early on, and how we can stop the autoimmune process early to prevent progression to the decreased quality of life common among the millions of Americans diagnosed with Sjogren's disease. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it along to Dr. Lieberman. All right, so thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. Let me change my pointer so that I can pretend like I'm old school with a laser pointer. Um, we'll see if we need that. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry that I'm not there in person. Um, having spent the first 29 plus years of my life in New Jersey and New York, um, I can say that I greatly missed the pizza. Uh, so I and the people, I guess. It would have been nice to be there, so maybe another time. But I am happy to be able to talk to you about Sjogren's and lupus. Um, as you heard in my introduction, Sjogren's is something I think about kind of constantly, so um, let's go ahead. So I don't have any financial conflicts of interest to disclose for those who are keeping score at home, and uh, hopefully throughout the course of the next, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, um, you will really get a better sense of the answers to these questions. So what is Sjogren's and why is it so confusing? Um, when I tell people I study Sjogren's, um, the next slide I think shows what often is going on in their mind. It's pretty much this. Uh, so many people have never heard of it and those who have have lots of other questions such as, is it Sjogren's with an apostrophe S? Is it Sjogren without an apostrophe S? Is it a syndrome? Is it a disease? And how do you even pronounce it anyway? Um, and so the confusion of Sjogren starts right from the beginning with what do we call it and how do you say it? Um, and I can provide some enlightenment perhaps on these. And, and so in terms of pronouncing, we typically say this as, as shown on the slide. So Sjogren is how we pronounce it. That is very much the Americanized version. Um, so Sjogren, Dr. Sjogren was a, a Swedish ophthalmologist. And so um, that is not how his name is pronounced in, uh, in Sweden. And from talking to Swedish people and doing interesting uh, Google searches, you can find the more correct pronunciation. It's a, it's a throatier sound, kind of more like Sjögren or something to that effect. Um, and that'll be fun to keep in the recording. Um, hopefully I was close. Uh, but we refer to it as Sjögren just because that is simpler. And in terms of syndrome or disease, um, classically it has often been referred to as Sjögren syndrome, though um, a recent letter to the editor at a, a rheumatology journal called Arthritis in Rheumatology, um, from the title you can see that there's a push to refer to it as a disease, not a syndrome. And this was written by Alan Bayer, who is a, a rheumatologist and the head of the, the Sjogren Center at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And Kathy Hammett is at the Sjogren's Foundation. She's the vice president for uh, medical and scientific affairs, I believe. And, um, and so they wrote that Sjogren syndrome should henceforth be known as Sjogren's disease. Uh, and they go on to explain that there is there are important differences between syndromes and diseases, um, whereas syndromes are kind of more collections of, of symptoms that can occur from a variety of reasons. Diseases are more specific um, with a more specific cause. Uh, and importantly, they point out that the struggle faced by Sjogren's patients to gain recognition for this serious autoimmune disease is difficult when some describe it as a collection of nuisance symptoms. And that is actually an interesting point because for a long time, many people, rheumatologists included, would consider Sjogren's to be sort of a, a nuisance disease, but not anything more significant than that. And um, those who have it, I'm sure, disagree. And, you know, the more we learn about it, the more we realize it is really, it is a real autoimmune disease. Um, and unfortunately, there are some 
some notions about it that have stuck. And the Sjogren Syndrome Foundation, um, you know, in a bold move, decided that they would drop the term syndrome. And so they are now the Sjogren's Foundation. And this is all um, in an attempt to sort of gain more, uh, more recognition for this condition. So what is Sjogren's? Um, so Sjogren's is a chronic autoimmune disease. And it the, the classic features are an autoimmune attack affecting the tear producing glands, which you can see they're called the lacrimal glands and they're up here kind of by the eye, which makes sense. Uh, and the saliva producing glands or the salivary glands, which the main salivary glands are the parotid gland in the cheek here. And then the submandibular gland, which is kind of just under the, the jawbone here. Um, but there's a variety of others we'll talk about as well. Um, and this autoimmune attack, uh, not surprisingly, leads to effects in the in the eyes and the mouth. So it causes dry eyes and dry mouth. And this may be sort of milder symptoms, including, you know, people needing to maybe drink a little bit more because their mouth gets dry, or maybe they don't wear their contact lenses as much because they're less comfortable. And so they wear their glasses more. And, and it may not be obvious that this is an autoimmune disease early on, um, but this can progress to cause vision threatening complications. Uh, and it can also cause very poor oral health. So there's, uh, it's very common to develop lots of cavities um, and people sometimes will lose their teeth. And then because the, the oral cavity is dry, um, it's not so easy to put in dentures and things like that. Um, and also people who have a lack of saliva I think tend to learn that we all take our normal saliva for granted. Um, and things like swallowing and talking that really require you to have a certain amount of saliva become difficult. But beyond the dry eyes and dry mouth, there are a variety of other features that often occur in Sjogren's. And so Sjogren's, similar to lupus, can really affect almost any organ in the body. And it is pretty common to get debilitating pain and fatigue as well. Plus the autoimmune process in Sjogren's puts individuals with Sjogren's at risk for developing lymphoma. Uh, and the antibodies that uh, are involved in Sjogren's can cause pregnancy complications. Specifically, they can cause something called neonatal lupus, which is actually not lupus at all, um, but is caused by the antibodies associated with, with Sjogren's. So together, all of these features lead to a significantly decreased quality of life for individuals with Sjogren's. And it turns out um, this is not uncommon. So the rough estimates are that Sjogren's affects approximately 4 million people in the United States. And that includes some estimates of uh, people who are likely not yet diagnosed um, for reasons we'll talk about in a little bit. The diagnosis itself is really not straightforward. Um, and there are no good treatments to halt this autoimmune process. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why I am motivated to, to study this disease because there's really a lot I think we can do, but, um, but we need to learn a lot more. So now that you're all experts in what Sjogren's is, um, if I haven't confused you already, we'll keep going. Who gets Sjogren's? So Sjogren's has classically been described as a disease of middle-aged women who develop profound dry mouth and dry eyes. And I don't think that's incorrect, but that's really just a part of the story. And so in a study by the, the Sjogren's Big Data Consortium um, that included over 12,000 patients diagnosed with, with Sjogren's without any other autoimmune diseases also diagnosed. Um, and this, this is from a, a variety of centers, multinationally, mostly from Europe, um, but it, I think it applies to people in the US as well. And you can see of these 12,000 people, this graph shows along the bottom, the age of diagnosis. I apologize, DX is an abbreviation for diagnosis. Um, and this is the age at which these people were diagnosed. And then the y-axis shows how many people within that were diagnosed within that age group. And you can see it is most commonly diagnosed in you know, the 40s to 60s, so you know, middle age-ish. And, um, and that's true, but there are people diagnosed in this study as young as five years old, and it goes really every age all the way up to 90. So this is a disease that, uh, that can occur at, at any time throughout life. Um, and when we talk about males and females and the, the sex differences, well, it is 
more commonly diagnosed in females, and that's true even during childhood. It's it's skewed sort of six females to one male, um, but and and then that gets even more skewed towards females during adulthood. Um, but it's not exclusively in females, and so there's over twelve thousand people. So pretending I didn't already do this math and that I can do really fast mental math, that means that of these twelve thousand people, there are a little over eight hundred of them were men or males. And so this isn't just a disease of females. Um, and then in terms of dryness, so dryness is certainly a common feature. Uh, and you can see among the adults, you know, 80, 90 plus percent of individuals have dryness as a feature. In the children, it's, it's also common, um, but less so. So 70% had dry eye, 80% had dry mouth. But if we look at the, the kids a little closer um, and break it down even further by age, so in the, you know, these are the different age ranges here, you can see that dryness is less common among those diagnosed younger, and it goes up over time. And this, this fits with the notion that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute or two, um, that dryness really is likely to be a later manifestation of the disease rather than um, the beginning of it. So who gets Sjogren's? Well, certainly if, if I, well, in my pediatric rheumatology practice, I never see middle-aged women um, unless they're parents of my patients. But in, in an adult rheumatology practice or any practice, if there is a middle-aged woman with profound dry mouth and dry eyes, absolutely Sjogren should be considered, but they're not the only ones who should be considered, right? It can occur in other adult females. It can occur in adult males. It can also occur in children. And it can occur in people who have other issues, but don't yet have dryness. So it really, you know, this is where I end up leaning towards Sjogren's can affect anyone, and it becomes really hard for me to figure out, well, who isn't affected? Um, and so, so this is the way I think about Sjogren's, um, and I'll take you through my little diagram here. But so again, it's an autoimmune disease affecting the saliva and tear-producing glands, although now you know it's really much more than that. Um, and going from left to right, so this black box on the left represents kind of the predisposing factors, some of which we probably have not yet identified, but certainly there are genetics, um, certain variants of genes and combinations of those variants that we know make you more likely to develop an autoimmune disease, there are environmental factors. And so these black box predisposing factors in the right setting will then lead to inflammation of the glands. And so this is just, when you look under the microscope, um, the kind of light pink over here, these are the normal parts of the gland. And then you have some red, which are the blood vessels and the white are the ducts where the saliva goes through. And then all these little purpley bluish spots, those are immune cells that are attacking the glands. They should not be there. And so this is, you know, the beginning. And for those who like immunology, it's the T cells that seem to dominate early on. And then a little later on, the B cells seem to kind of take over. And some of those B cells will mature to become cells that make antibodies, and they'll make autoantibodies that will contribute. So then the autoantibodies and the inflammation itself will start to cause damage and dysfunction of the glands. So then the glands kind of stop producing the amount of, of liquid that they're supposed to be producing, and then the dryness symptoms develop, and this increases slowly over time. And then there hits a critical threshold where the dryness becomes profound and then people go to the doctor. And, um, and this is in large part why uh, this has often been thought of as a disease of middle-aged women because this slowly progressive dryness, people often find ways to overcome it until the hormone changes associated with menopause, which tend to cause dryness in people even who don't have Sjogren's. And so the combination of that and this Sjogren's process um, really makes the dryness very profound and often results in seeking medical attention. Um, but as I said, uh, that's not the only thing that should uh, suggest the possibility of Sjogren's. And it turns out that studies that have been done in Scandinavia, so in uh, Norway and Sweden, I think it was, whenever you give blood to do any blood tests, they actually save any leftover for research purposes. And so investigators there were able to take samples from people who were diagnosed with Sjogren's and they looked 
you know, however far back they could look to see, can they find the autoantibodies here in those blood samples? And they found that up to like 20 years before diagnosis, they were finding these antibodies present. And then they just didn't have older samples than that. And, and so, and the inflammation is probably starting even before that. So the point here is that this autoimmune process is probably going on for, for years, sometimes many years, before the dryness becomes so apparent that people are seeking medical attention. Um, so then how do we diagnose it? Uh, well, we have a variety of tests to measure these sort of three major features of the disease. So there are ways to measure the function of the gland. So you can measure how much tears are being produced. And that's something called the Schirmer test, which if people have questions, I can go through the details. Um, there's ocular surface staining where you can look for damage to the surface of the cornea from chronic inflammation and dryness. And then there are ways to measure saliva um, to see is there enough saliva that would be normal or abnormal. And, and those are ways to measure gland dysfunction. Um, and then measuring the antibodies, there are a variety of antibodies associated with Sjogren's. So the ANA or anti-nuclear antibody, which you may have, you may be aware of because that is often associated with lupus as well. Um, there's the SSA, which stands for Sjogren's syndrome A and SSB. And those are also referred to as Rho and La. Um, those are more highly considered sort of Sjogren's related antibodies though nothing is absolute, and we'll talk about that a little later. Um, and then there's the rheumatoid factor, or RF. And, you know, as the name suggests, rheumatoid factor is also commonly um, found in people with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it can also be found in people with lupus and in people with Sjogren's. And, um, and so none of these tests is really perfect for Sjogren's, but these are the, the groups of antibodies that are tested for Typically, there are a variety of others that are being studied and people are trying to identify the perfect test to say yes or no, but unfortunately, um, we haven't reached that point. And then to look for gland inflammation, typically salivary gland biopsies are done. And so these biopsies um, really most commonly are not the, the major salivary glands that we talked about, but they're usually the minor salivary glands in the lower lip. So I know you're all gonna wanna do this, but if you run your, your tongue along your lower lip Come do one of these things. You know, you can't really talk while you're doing that, but um, you should feel some, you know, a bunch of bumps in there. And many of those bumps are, are balls of cells that make saliva. So those are the minor salivary glands. And experienced people such as ear, nose, and throat specialists, or I send people to our oral pathologist at the College of Dentistry, they can make a really small incision and remove a few of those glands to look to see, does it look like, like this? Um, in, under the microscope, and that's helpful for diagnosis. So as I mentioned though, you know, dryness is a late feature. So we'd really like to, to be able to diagnose this, diagnose this before dryness develops. And in kids, um, as I mentioned, often the dryness is not really um, significant when we measure. And so we rely on the antibodies and the biopsy studies. But when you look at those, um, looking at the numbers, you know, it, approximately 80 to 90 percent of, of people with Sjogren's will have a positive ANA test. So that means, you know, 10 to 20 percent will not. 70 percent or so have a positive SSA test. And I, I bolded that one and I mentioned that that's kind of the one that's most commonly used and most specific for this disease. The SSB is less common, but when the SSB is detected, it's usually in people who also have an SSA. So it doesn't add a whole lot. And then rheumatoid factor is also in about 50%. So again, you can see here, none of these tests, even if you group them all together, um, nothing is 100%. Uh, and so then there's also the lip biopsy, which equally is not perfect um, and, and may be adequately abnormal to suggest Sjogren's in, in 80 to 85% of people, which means there's going to be a group of people who have Sjogren's who maybe don't have that on their lip biopsy. And so this is kind of where I'm getting, uh, where I come from with the diagnosis is not straightforward because there are a lot of tests we do, but they don't always all make perfect sense. So we need better tests. So now that diagnosis is clear, um, let's move on to, to some of the features. So as I mentioned, dryness is a key feature of Sjogren's and this can affect the eyes and the mouth as we talked about, it can also affect the throat. Um, it can make swallowing difficult. Um, it can affect the airways, the tubes going down to the lungs and you can get a, a dry cough from this. Um, and it feels like, you know, sort of irritation that you can't, you can't 
fix or bring up. The skin can be dry and also um, there can be vaginal dryness as well. Gland swelling. So the parotid glands, again, in the cheeks, those can become swollen. And in kids, that's one of the most common things that we see. They'll get recurrent episodes of swelling in their glands. Sometimes it affects the submandibular glands. And so in some individuals, it can affect the lacrimal gland swelling above the eyes. Um, then pain, uh, often in joints, in muscles, may or may not be associated with inflammation of those areas. But that's very common. And fatigue is also very common. But beyond these features, I mentioned Sjogren's can affect really any system in the body. And there's a lot on here that I, I, we don't need to go through all the details, but I wanted to point out. So the, the features in Sjogren's that can occur include constitutional features such as fevers and weight loss. You can have enlarged lymph nodes, enlarged glands like we just talked about, joint pain, joint stiffness. You can have actual arthritis rashes that can be caused by all sorts of things, including inflammation of blood vessels, which is also known as vasculitis. Um, effects in the lungs can cause you to be short of breath. Um, and most commonly, we see interstitial lung disease, or ILD. Uh, in the kidneys, you can have abnormal tests when your urine is tested. There can be blood or protein in the urine, and that, that is caused by different forms of inflammation in the kidneys called nephritis. Um, muscles can be weak. Uh, and that may be associated with actual inflammation of the muscles called myositis. And then nerves can be affected. So you can develop a neuropathy and that can cause all sorts of issues in terms of sensations and tingling and, and weakness as well. Um, the brain can be involved. There can be inflammation of the brain and the spinal cord. And in the most dramatic form, you can develop blindness and paralysis, not a common thing at all. What's more common is cognitive dysfunction. So like this brain fog where you just feel like your head is in a cloud and can't really focus. Um, some people develop seizures. And um, then in, in the blood, you can have low blood counts that can affect anything, platelets, hemoglobin causing anemia or, um, or white blood cells. And then the so-called biologic system, which is really sort of a blanket term for kind of immune tests, typically. Um, but you can have low complements. You can have abnormal immunoglobulins, which are the antibodies, just all the antibodies floating around, or many of the antibodies floating around, excuse me, in the blood. And this can be elevated most commonly, but it can also be low. And so these are, and these aren't even all of the features that can occur, but this, these are the features that are often included when people do research studies and try to score the disease activity. Um, and in case you haven't noticed, um, many of these features are very similar to what we see in people with lupus. And I'm not going to go through all of the lupus ones, but you know, for those of you who are visual people, I'm going to bold all of the things that are very similar between the two diseases. And that's a lot of bolding on that slide. So you can see that um, there, there's a lot of overlap in the features that occur in Sjogren's and the features that occur in lupus. Um, and then you add the complications and the difficulty in diagnosing these diseases, then it's not surprising to know that they're, you know, that it can be confusing to distinguish the two sometimes. So now I'm going to do a little uh, a little exercise here. So um, I don't know if the <clears throat> let's see maybe I can turn that off. All right, I don't know if you were seeing that or not. But um, so what's listed here? So some of you may realize diagnosing lupus and Sjogren's is tricky. Um, for research studies, there needs to be a more specific or a, or a more sort of um, defined way to, to classify diseases to decide, should does someone meet these criteria to be able to be in a study or not? Uh, and so these listed here are the newest iteration of the lupus criteria. And what happens is each of these features gets a specific score, and that's what the numbers are. Um, and then you add up the numbers, and if the score is 10 or more, then they can be classified as lupus and, uh, and participate in research studies. And so, um, you know, for lupus, with these criteria, the anti-nuclear antibody or ANA needs to be detected, um, and then you go through the scoring system. So, but we just talked about, you know, the overlap between lupus and Sjogren's. And so I, I kind of like to go through this um, in this way. So let's say you have someone who has a positive anti-nuclear antibody, has a fever and joint symptoms and a low complement C4 level. So they have an ANA so that they can now be considered for the possibility of lupus. Fever is worth two points. The joint symptoms are six points and the low complement C4 is worth three points. So then that adds up to 11 points. So 
does this person have lupus? I mean, they, they meet the criteria, right? So they, they have a score of greater than or equal to 10. Um, and I would say if they also have lupus specific antibodies, like an anti double stranded DNA antibody or an anti Smith antibody, then yes, they also get a higher score because they get another six points. But, um, but now those antibodies really, to me, suggest, yeah, this is, this is lupus. Um, but what if they don't have those antibodies? What if instead they have an SSA and an SSB antibody detected? Uh, me, I would have them get a lip biopsy. So what if they then get that lip biopsy and it's positive for, for looking like Sjogren's? Well, I would say this person has Sjogren's. Um, do they also have lupus? that becomes trickier. I mean, I think Sjogren's can explain all of these features, but technically they still do meet that lupus score. Um, and then if they also have the anti-double-stranded DNA antibody or an anti-Smith antibody with the lupus antibody or the Sjogren's antibodies and the lip biopsy, well, then I'd say this person probably has lupus and Sjogren's. Um, and you can have both. There's no reason you can't um, have just one. And, um, and it, you know, it's confusing sometimes to tell the difference. So in terms of lupus and Sjogren's, the SSA antibody, for example, which is, in my opinion, generally a Sjogren's related antibody, um, can be positive in individuals with lupus. And in different reports, depending on where you look, it can be found in 20% or up to 50% of people with lupus may have this Sjogren's antibody. Now, if you're me and you're slightly biased towards thinking everyone has, uh, has Sjogren's, then you might say, well, why don't those people have lupus and Sjogren's, why, why does the SSA have to be associated with their lupus? But that's sort of an impossible thing to, to tease apart. Um, but up to 15 to 20% of individuals with lupus do have a diagnosis of Sjogren's. And this is often called secondary Sjogren's. Um, that's because primary Sjogren's is the term often used when it's someone who has Sjogren's and no other autoimmune disease, but it's common to have Sjogren's and other autoimmune diseases. And so people tend to use the term secondary Sjogren's. We're, we're trying to move away from that. Um, and there was a nice review. I, I love the title of this, Equal Rights in Autoimmunity. Is Sjogren's Syndrome Ever Secondary? Well, they use syndromes. I don't love that. But, um, but is it ever secondary? And so the term secondary tends to suggest that one disease causes the other, right? So if you have lupus and Sjogren's, I don't think based on the disease, the way the diseases develop, I don't think the lupus causes the Sjogren's. So the term secondary is probably not... Um, not the best, but as I said, there are 15 to 20% of individuals with diagnoses of both lupus and Sjogren's. Um, sorry, 15 to 20% of people with lupus also have a diagnosis of Sjogren's. That's, that's how I should word that. Um, so what do we know about people who have lupus and Sjogren's? Well, there have been several studies comparing people with lupus with Sjogren's to people with lupus without Sjogren's. And um, the suggestion is that there may be some differences. So people with lupus with Sjogren's tended to be older at the time they were diagnosed with lupus. They tended to have, uh, or it was more common for them to have positive Sjogren's related antibodies, such as the SSA antibody, and the SSB antibody um, and rheumatoid factor. And they had higher levels of immunoglobulin uh, than people with lupus without Sjogren's. They also more commonly have a low white blood cell count, it's also called leukopenia. And they more commonly have peripheral neuropathy. And I think one of the biggest findings was that they, it was less common to have nephritis, the kidney inflammation that, that often characterizes lupus. Um, but, and I, I used italics for the mores and the lesses, because it wasn't split with, if you have lupus and Sjogren's, then you have these manifestations. And if you have lupus without Sjogren's, then you don't have those manifestations. It wasn't simple like that. For example, with nephritis, I think it was like 30% of people with lupus with Sjogren's had nephritis, whereas 40% had nephritis if they had lupus without Sjogren's. So none of this is absolute. And, and so we really can't say anything major about people who have lupus with or without Sjogren's. Um, and there were many other features of lupus that there were not differences, whether you had lupus with Sjogren's or lupus without Sjogren's. So um, I think we have more to learn from this. Uh, and um, it, it can be helpful in terms of, you know, how do you treat? Certainly for lupus, as many of you are probably aware, there are 
a variety of medications that are commonly used. So there is really, a, I think, a standard of care that has been established, and several of the medications now are actually FDA approved to modulate the immune system in individuals with lupus. Um, that is something that is not true for Sjogren's. So there have not been any medications to modulate the immune system uh, that have been identified or that have been approved by the FDA, the, Federal, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. Um, to, to, for use in Sjogren's. And so um, in that sense, it, it's very frustrating because people with Sjogren's, it's hard to find the right treatment. There are treatments available for dryness symptoms. Um, so you can put in artificial tears. If you have inflammation in the eyes, you can also use tear or artificial tears or, or drops that have medication in them that can calm the inflammation. And uh, there are stimulants for tears and saliva. None of these is perfect. Um, they work for some people. They sometimes don't work as well as we would like them to work. And so really there's, we need more um, for Sjogren's. And, and there's a lot of research actually ongoing currently to try to figure it out. One of the problems is the adults with Sjogren's who are being studied in all of these big clinical trials are adults with Sjogren's. And so they, as I described earlier, they probably have had disease going on for many years, and so it may be harder to really alter that process in a short period of time. So um, we're working on it, but it's, it's tough. So lupus with Sjogren's. So when would you consider Sjogren's in someone with lupus? And I would say anyone who has features of dryness, whether they have lupus or not, um, it's worth considering the possibility of Sjogren's, that there are lots of causes of dryness. And so if you have dryness, it doesn't mean you definitely have Sjogren's, um, but it's something worth considering. Anyone who has positive Sjogren's antibodies, SSA, SSB, even rheumatoid factor, I would say it's worth considering the possibility of Sjogren's um, because it may very well be that that's, that's an indication suggesting Sjogren's. Um, anyone who has features that just don't quite fit with lupus, um, and that's tough because lupus can do essentially anything, so I don't even know what I mean by that, but, you know, if things are just not behaving the way you would expect they should in treating lupus, I would think, okay, is it possible that they're Sjogren's, and, and is it worth looking into that? And again, if you're me, then maybe anyone should be considered for having Sjogren's because, Again, if you're waiting for the dryness, it may be too late, so it might be better to identify them earlier, but that's a slight bias of mine, perhaps, um, and maybe unfair to say. So why does it matter anyway? I just told you that it's a, a difficult thing to diagnose, and um, it's a confusing condition, and we really don't have great treatments. So, so do you need to know if you have Sjogren's? Um, and, and that, I think, is debatable at this point. Um, you know, we think that the treatments for lupus should modulate the immune system in a way that should help with Sjogren's, but um, it's, it's hard to know for sure. And so it matters, I think, because if you know you have Sjogren's, then you may be more likely to get vigilant oral health care. And that is really, I mean, some people with Sjogren's who have the profound dryness and, and lots of cavities, um, they need to go to the dentist every three months even um, to get fluoride treatments and other preventative measures to try to keep their teeth as healthy as possible um, in the absence of having saliva to, to keep them healthy. Um, also vigilant eye care, you know, making sure you're going to the, the eye doctor frequently enough so they can monitor for inflammation, because if you do develop the inflammation on the cornea, on the surface of the eye, you want to make sure that that's being taken care of. And that's one area where the eye drops can be very helpful. So those anti-inflammatory eye drops can help um, control the inflammation in the eye. And so with a diagnosis of Sjogren's, it might prompt people to suggest or prompt you to go more, more frequently to, to see the eye care provider. And then there are guidelines that are evolving. So the Sjogren's Foundation is leading the, the charge to try to come up with guidelines for monitoring for things that can have more significant um, complications, such as lung disease, lymphoma, neuropathy. Um, and then they're just kind of going down the list and doing as many as they can over time. And so as these guidelines evolve, if you have a diagnosis of Sjogren's, then you should be monitored for these things according to the guidelines. And so it may be helpful to know if you have Sjogren's, so you know, should you be going and getting certain tests done? Um, and then also there will be guidelines evolving for the treatment. Um, I mean, there already are guidelines, although they're 
they're not great because again, there aren't medications that are known to work, but there are many pharmaceutical companies interested now um, in, in trying to identify treatments that work for Sjogren's. And so there are quite a few trials that are underway. So hopefully soon we will have treatments. And so if you don't know you have Sjogren's, you may not get the appropriate treatments. So the take home message then in terms of Sjogren's disease is that Sjogren's occurs in many individuals, not just middle-aged women, though it can occur in middle-aged women. Sjogren's involves features that may overlap with those of lupus and that makes it really confusing. Um, dryness may not be evident early and it may come on slowly to the point where, you know, you deal with it day to day and you don't necessarily notice it so much. Um, and you really need a high index of suspicion or your doctor needs a high index of suspicion in order to really kind of think about Sjogren's and, and whether or not testing should be done. And then a great resource, I cannot state it enough, is the Sjogren's Foundation. They have a great group of individuals who are really leading um, a lot in terms of getting industry involved, getting patients connected with clinical trials and, you know, guidelines, support groups. Um, so Sjogren's.org if anyone's interested. And, um, and I think that is all. I may have gone a little fast, but I wanted to leave time for questions. Um,